You may or may not have noticed the image um, that was, or I guess, is it on the order of service? The image that I selected, actually created, to go with um, the sermon that I'm giving today. Um, I couldn't really find what I was looking for when I looked in Google Images, but I wanted a class list, the same kind of class list that as teachers we get at the beginning of every year. Okay, here are your students. Here's the list. So I created that list. I don't know whether you looked at the names. They're fictitional. I would never have put actual students. They're fictitional names. I don't know if they're big enough for you to see, but I tried to come up with names that represented different cultures, ethnicities, names where you might look at the first name and wonder, hmm, boy, girl, not a boy, not a girl, transgender? Well, one thing that is very clear today is that we don't separate or can't separate people simply into two groups. We have people who are binary, non-binary, transgender, female, male. And one of the things that I listed on that class list was personal pronouns, something that teachers today are coming to understand is very important. So there are two names on that list that go by they, their, and them, and not by he, him, or his, and not by she, her, or hers. And I think it's very important for everybody to be able to uh, understand uh, what is important to individuals in terms of their identity. And so I'm very thankful that in the school where I teach, learning about our transition to the use of personal pronouns has been part of our teacher education. As I was scrolling through my Facebook feed the other day, I read a quote about teachers that struck me as extremely insightful. It read something like this. In September of every school year, students are simply names on a class list to their teacher. By April, a teacher has influenced every one of those lives. As I pondered the meaning of this quote, I thought about the power imbued excuse me, in relationships between teachers and their students. A teacher is responsible for the growth and well-being of all the students under his or her care or their care. The job brings with it a great responsibility as evidenced in the quote that I just cited. So teachers have the power to influence in positive ways. They also have the power to influence in negative ways. And for younger children in particular, teachers can have a very significant influence on their growth. I'm going to remind you that in the poem that uh, Stephen read, Contribution to Statistics, out of every hundred people, good and bad, black, brown, and white, afraid and in pain, and wise in hindsight, we are all worthy of compassion. If a teacher is a good teacher, each and every student is worthy of compassion. Each and every student has dignity. So no matter how much they might annoy you, are difficult, are frustrating, you've got to keep that in mind. You've got to keep that in mind. Schools and teachers are called to change as new information about teaching and learning evolves. If a school or teacher resists change despite evidence that there are better ways to promote student learning and growth, they are depriving their students of a chance to benefit from this change and may in fact be causing harm to students through the use of misguided practice or reliance on false beliefs. 
Now, I'm going to speak of change that I've noticed within my teaching years, which I can't say represents the majority of teachers or the majority of schools in this country, because I've taught in four schools that were all independent or private schools, even though I went to public school myself. And I've taught in schools that were all on the East Coast. So my experience cannot uh, exemplify the experience of all teachers and all schools. So just to quickly reference where I taught, when I graduated from college, my first job was teaching fifth and sixth graders at a school in Brooklyn, New York, called Poly Prep Country Day School. From there, I went to Charlottesville and taught at a school called St. Anne's Belfield that was just down the road from the University of Virginia. Here in Wilmington, I taught at Ursuline, a school that is an all-girls, independent Catholic school. They let me teach there even though I'm not Catholic. And currently, I teach at a Quaker school in Wilmington, Delaware, Wilmington Friends School. I taught middle school math for the first 11 years of my career. A lot of times people would look at me and say, you taught middle school? What, are you crazy? Then I had an opportunity to stay at home with my two daughters for about 13 years. As I went back to teaching, I started teaching at Wilmington Friends School. And I've taught fourth grade students. As a reminder to you all, we're talking about nine-year-old students who are turning 10. They're just beginning to learn how to think abstractly. They're just beginning to pick up on sarcasm. So for the past 11 years, I've taught fourth grade. I've taught the entire fourth grade math. We have two fourth grade classes. Math is kind of my thing. I also taught my class social studies, and I taught them reading. So what have educators learned in recent years about how students learn? First, our understanding about learning and the human brain has improved. Because we have a better understanding of how the human brain works, we also have better insight into how people learn. Complicating the situation, however, is that no two learners learn in exactly the same way. So as a new teacher, you figure that out pretty quickly. What may have worked for one student may not work for everybody. In addition, no one teacher is equally skilled at addressing all of the unique needs of different individuals. Here are some things that we now know about successful teaching and learning. When I think back to a traditional classroom, I think of desks in rows. I think of the teacher standing up in the front by a chalkboard, all the students sitting there listening, supposedly. Maybe contributing, maybe not. It's really the, sh the teacher. It's the teacher's show. It's really no longer the way that we try to teach students. Let me give you an example from my math classroom and the other math classrooms in our school, at least in the lower school. Today, I have my students, and this isn't always, but a lot of the times, start with what I call an anchor task. They're asked to explore an unfamiliar problem that may require out-of-the-box thinking and can most often be solved in many different ways. Students can work on their own, but they're encouraged to work collaboratively. Usually students get right down to business and are really excited to figure things out. The teacher acts as facilitator, not a dispenser of knowledge. Students have been taught the explicit skills that they'll need to solve the problem. So maybe they'll need to know how to do multi-digit multiplication. After every student has worked on the problem for a period of time, students are given an opportunity 
to explain strategies to their peers and to share their thinking. Over time, each student develops a toolbox of strategies that include what they've learned from each other. And in my experience, the students are so excited to share how they solve the problem. I've even had students like practically falling out of their seat because they want to share. So successful learners actively engage and construct their own knowledge. Educators also have realized, again, I'll relate it to the math classroom, that the use of concrete materials can be really important. Giving students a way to learn that involves sensory experiences can help them to learn. And then oftentimes we progress from using a concrete model to drawings or diagrams and then to the more abstract learning. We also want to make sure that students understand why something works and why they're even bothering to do it in the first place. I think traditionally, I think of long division, fourth grade, long division. I don't know if you have any memories of long division, but I actually remember being given a page of long division problems and our teacher gave us way too many. I mean, I was there for well over an hour working on these things. Guess what? The traditional process that we use really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to almost everyone. It really is a shortcut um, that's been developed over time. So allowing students to use different types of strategies and methods can also help them to understand well, what is it that I'm really doing? Oh, yeah, I'm taking this number, I'm dividing it by three, so I'm making three equal groups. Or maybe I'm seeing how many groups of three I could make with this number. Also due to our increased knowledge of learning in the human brain, schools and teachers are better prepared to work with students who do not learn in traditional ways. Have you heard of the word neuro? Diversity? How many people have heard that word before? Can you raise your hands? I will say this year is the first year I've heard that word. And to tell you about neurodiversity, I'll quote from a Harvard Medical School publication. They define it as the idea that people experience and interact with the world around them in many different ways. There is no one right way of thinking, learning, and behaving. Educators now know that having a learning difference is not a deficit. It's not something to be ashamed of. It simply means that traditional educational practices may not work for neurodiverse individuals. So, who are these individuals? People who are dyslexic. I'm forgetting the exact statistics, but I would say there are about 10 to 20% of people, maybe more like 10, I'd have to look it up. Is it 20? Okay, I thought it was 20, there we go. Are dyslexic. So there are people in this room who are dyslexic, who've had a much harder time learning how to read because they learn differently. At the same time, dyslexics are often extremely bright individuals. Who else is, incur who is included in the category of neurodiverse? People on the autistic spectrum. It's an interesting word, but within that category of autism are all different types of learners, all different types of people. And I think we all know that there are autistic people who are absolutely brilliant. Who else is included? Oh yes, those students that I have every year who have attention issues. 
I don't remember when I was a student ever hearing about someone having an attention issue. When I first started teaching, there was a small group of students who I was told they meet with a specialist twice a week because she's helping them. They have some attention issues or are having trouble reading. I didn't really think too much about it. In today's classroom, I would say you can have within, say, a, cl a class of 20 students, you might have anywhere from two to maybe seven or eight students who have attention issues. They learn differently. So in today's educational world, we celebrate these differences. And we help parents understand that these are not things to be ashamed of. These are things that we simply say, how can we best serve your child? How about social and emotional growth? With COVID, with everything going on in the world, with the media that students are exposed to, anxiety, depression, suicide, on the rise for young people. Colleges, universities are becoming more and more aware of the fact that there are brilliant students at their schools who are terribly depressed, who are harming themselves, who are cutting themselves with knives because the pain is unbearable. And yet, we emphasize academics. Wait a second, what about being able to navigate your own emotions. What about emotion, emotional regulation? What about how do I cope in life? What about strategies for coping? So these days, at least in my school, we're starting to implement actual instruction with respect to social and emotional skills. Research has shown that these skills can be taught. It's not just assumed that, oh, they'll figure it out as they grow older. With our fourth graders, we've used a program called Owning Up, and students have an opportunity uh, not only to uh, think about how each and every person is worthy of dignity and respect, but how to navigate difficult issues, how to think about that negative self-talk that we all have, every single one of us. How to feel confident, how to advocate for yourself. And you know what some of my students say? When are we gonna have owning up? That's one of their favorite classes. So I came across a book called The Social and Emotional Playbook, A Guide to Student and Teacher Well-Being. What about teachers? Don't they need to be emotionally well? So emotional regulation for students, it says in this book, I think it's really for everybody, begins with learning the names of emotions and matching those labels to your feelings. How many adults are good at labeling their feelings? I wonder. Students learn that we all have emotions. There are names for the feelings that we have. Emotions are not good or bad. There are ways to respond when you experience a specific emotion. Now to look at the idea of values. Like I said, I teach at a Quaker school. For those of you who don't know anything about Quakerism, it's pretty similar to Unitarian Universalism, I have to say. A lot of overlap. So in our Quaker school, Quakers have uh, testaments that are known as the spices. Simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, stewardship. We try to instill those values in our students. So let's think about values like truth, justice, and integrity. 
Don't we want our students to have those values? Today's students are much more aware of the fact that there is bias and discrimination in today's world. Even by fourth grade, do you know that by kindergarten, students are aware of skin color? By kindergarten. So it's important that students understand why does this bias and discrimination exist? Why are there groups that treat each other in unfair ways? In addition, in teaching social studies, guess what? American history. Okay, is it all about heroes and bravery and all those wonderful accomplishments? Hmm. What about the painful truth? that Europeans came to this country and there were already people who lived here, indigenous people. How many indigenous people around the world were treated poorly, died from disease, conquered, sent away from their land, killed? You might be thinking, well, that's kind of a lot for a fourth grader to handle. Well, you have to put it in context, but you can't lie to them about these things. Colonization really is taking over someone else's land. <clears throat> in meeting the goals of instilling values such as truth, justice, and integrity, here are a few other things that our students, at least at my school, think about, grapple with, and are asked to consider. Number one, the importance of diverse communities and how living, working, or belonging to a diverse community leads to a better understanding of what is fair and just. The unfair treatment of the LGBTQ plus community, how it exists, and that we now know that people cannot be divided into simply female, male, nor can we assume who someone might be attracted to. The continuing existence of racism. And there are books written for upper elementary students that very much focus on the issue of racism. There's a book that I've read to my students called Ghost Boys. The main character is a black boy around 10 or 11 years old who is shot by a white policeman. And in this book, the boy is floating overhead as a ghost and watching what's happening and ultimately befriends the white daughter <clears throat> of the policeman. Very powerful book. Jewel Parker Rhodes, author. And as I mentioned before, students also realize and discuss the inherent bias in American history. So the last thing I'll mention is technology. How has that changed things? Well, it's brought about advantages, but it's also brought about disadvantages, and it's kind of important to be aware of both of those. How has technology shaped student behavior? How has technology provided for educational experiences that you and I didn't have when we were younger? So I kind of hate to share this, <laughs> but uh, I really think that technology has brought about some not so great student behavior. Um, but I also think that being aware of it can help us manage it. First of all, there's that need for immediate gratification. Boom, I type something in, there's my answer. I'm playing a video game, boom, this is happening. I want it now. Impulsivity with respect for waiting for one's turn. More and more often students call out, speak over one another, and even speak over the teacher. Can you imagine? I'm in the middle of talking and a student starts saying something? Yep, happens every day. 
and a lack of respectful behavior. Because mm, this isn't particularly interesting, and the students really just want those things that are interesting. Now, of course, this isn't every student, okay? And then the last thing I'll mention is um, poor listening skills. When you're using technology, you're not conversing with another person. Um, there's not that sense of give and take. Technology can also affect the lives of teachers. Some teachers feel like they have to be on their email 24-7. Just ask my husband. <laughs> He'll tell me, uh-uh, don't get on your school email <laughs> at 7 o'clock at night on Saturday. Um, we get multiple emails every day, and that's a big part of what I have to do when I'm at school. How about getting waylaid when you're trying to plan a lesson, and there's so much information that you take a whole lot of time looking through it. And last but not least, increased time in front of a computer screen. How does that affect all of us? In summary, the school experience of young people today cannot be directly compared to the experiences that we had. Although there are both causes for concern and changes to celebrate, there is one thing that remains constant. Those names on the class list in September will take on new significance and meaning to the teacher who is lucky enough to be given the task of shaping the lives of future generations.